tantrums. Everybody deals with them. Some 90% of three-year-olds experience them. It's probably the biggest question that I get as a therapist, as a coach for parents, and as a content creator on all the social media platforms. And today I wanna to talk about them and looking at about three main points, how we've looked at them in the past, how I look at them now, and what you can do to try and help your kids get through them. Looking at the past, historically, tantrums have been looked at behaviorally. This means that we are saying them as something that we we need to get rid of. And I get that your sentiment there because they are very frustrating. They're hard to deal with. And they bring up a lot of these emotions within us. So we're like, I don't want to feel this way. I don't want my kid to have to feel this way. How do I get my kid to stop experiencing them? And when we look at them behaviorally, that means that we're going to start to try and address them behaviorally. This means that a lot of the uh, strategies that people have brought up in the past involve ignoring them, doing planned ignoring. Like if your kid has a tantrum, you look the other way. Don't give any, any eye contact, don't give them any kind of verbal expression, nothing. Also, this using a behavioral strategy is going to make people more likely to use things like rewards and punishment. So if you don't have a tantrum, you are going to get to get a toy from wherever. Or if you do have a tantrum, then you're going to get a timeout, you're going to get sent to your room until you can calm yourself down and then I'm ready to actually deal with you. Now the problem is, this behavioral look, while we can use it to some degree, it doesn't help us actually better help our children develop emotionally. And looking at things behaviorally keeps us from looking at these situations objectively. And we'll talk about that more here in just a second. So when I look at tantrums, I like to now look at them in one of two different ways. And oftentimes those ways are merged together. Number one is that they are an incredibly important developmental milestone. A milestone that teaches kids three really important skills. One, that they can experience big feelings and that they will still be okay after the fact. Two, that they can experience these same big feelings and that their mom or dad or caregiver is still going to give them love and affection and attention after it's over. Like they are not less accepted because they experience these big feelings. And three, Tantrums are an important part of kids learning how to self-regulate their emotions. And a big part of learning that self-regulation is, which we'll get to when we talk about what parents can do, but a big part of that is parents self-regulating themselves and being a part of that regulation with their children. The other way that I like to look at tantrums is they are a form of communication. Tantrums exist because kids may not have the words to articulate what it is that they're experiencing. They may not have the words for the sensations going on in their body. They may not have the words to tell you how unfair something feels. They can also come about because children don't feel like we are listening to them. So maybe they have tried to communicate with us in earlier ways. In fact, many times children do try and communicate with us in some way to let us know that something is bothering them or that they think something is unfair. Now they may not be able to use the words, that's unfair mom, but they are going to try and tell you their discontent before it usually gets to that point. Now. If we have consistently not listened to those words, whether it be because we're looking at it as behavioral or as we are the authority figure and kids are going to listen to us no matter what and I'm not going to give in, no matter what the reasoning is, if we've consistently said my word is the word and we're not going to hear any kind of dissent, then kids may have learned that that earlier stage of communication isn't going to be any help whatsoever, so they might move quicker to the tantrum stage. That's not always the case, but it absolutely can play a role. And in that case, tantrums become the nuclear option whenever all forms of communication have failed. Now I say nuclear option, which kind of implies that it is a choice. Tantrums are not a choice. They're children experiencing emotions and not having the ability to be able to regulate themselves or to communicate in another way. So it's not necessarily a choice. I just use it as a nuclear option because it's like saying that nothing else works and this is the ultimate way that I can tell you and express my discontent. 
And it's important to understand that tantrums really exist because children are experiencing anger and sadness due to some perceived injustice or disappointment. And some of those are legitimate. And parents and adults, we experience these same things too. For example, you order something off the menu at the restaurant and the waiter tells you, sorry, we actually don't have any more of that left. And you're like, oh great, the one thing that I really wanted and I got my mindset on, now they don't have. Now it's a mini tantrum. It's not going to be to the level of a three-year-old. Though if you look at social media, you can see adults that have experienced tantrums like this out in public. Um, but generally, Kids are experiencing these emotions because of this injustice that they're feeling. And it might be because we are setting rules that they think are unfair. Also, it could be that kids are um, just experiencing the disappointment, the unfairness that they really want ice cream and we don't have ice cream. So they get upset about that, which is understandable and fair. So what do we do as parents to help kids when we think about tantrums in this other way? One, try your best to catch early communication and listen to it. Hear kids out. So even if it seems like this outlandish thing, for example, they say, I want the red cup, I don't want the blue cup. And you say, I hear you. You really want the red cup. And it's just, it's frustrating because the blue cup is dirty and that's the one you really, really want. By hearing kids out first, without trying to use our logical adult brain to be like, it's not that big of a deal, it's just a cup, it's not going to actually impact the taste of your food or drink in any way whatsoever. Just be happy with what you got. When we act like that and talk like that to kids, that is part of us teaching them that those uh, early communication things don't really do anything and it leads them to be more likely to go into the tantrum stage. And when we start to listen to them, we can actually help them problem solve it. So using the same cup example, it might lead us to have a conversation around, oh, you're so upset because you really want the red cup and the that one's in the dirty dishes and oh man, that's so frustrating. And they're like, yeah, I just want the red cup. And you say, what do you think we can do? And they say, you should wash it. And I say, how about this? Let's wash it together. And now we have, instead of us dressing each other, like I'm the person that's not letting them have the cup and they're the victim who can't have the cup. Now we have joined together to uh, jointly solve a problem and to learn how to communicate around that problem. And we've also modeled solution solving in that issue. Another thing that parents can do is ask yourself this question which is really two questions, but one, am I holding this boundary that is causing the tantrum? Am I holding it just because I don't wanna give in to the tantrum? I hear this all the time of parents being like, I actually thought that they had a really good point, but I didn't wanna teach them that tantrums are an appropriate way to get their need met. So I held strong. And the problem with that is that, well, the kid is making a really valid point and their injustice that they're feeling is legitimate according to your thought process. And it's perfectly okay to be like, you know what, you're right. There's no reason for me not to give you the blue cup. Let's go wash it and give it to you. And then later on and through those early communication times, we teach them other ways to be able to communicate. And the other question which we kind of already alluded to is, are they making a valid point? For example, I've had my own kid who would have a tantrum because he wanted to use the spoon and I had the spoon that I was using to feed him, but he had to have it in his hands and he started to throw a fit. He wouldn't eat, he started screaming. And at some point, I, after holding that boundary for a minute, I'm like, what are we doing here? Like, there are many spoons. I could just go grab a new spoon and give him the, the spoon that I'm using and I can just go get a new one. And we did, and I said, you're making a valid point and I'm sorry, here you go. And we were able to then eat uh, with no other issues. And the last thing, in those cases where you're holding the boundary because you need to hold the boundary, and you're holding the boundary because you there's just no other option, like 
the ice cream example. Maybe they there's just no ice cream. You can't give them ice cream. Even if you wanted to or you were perfectly okay with it, you just can't give it to them. In those cases, it's about one, giving kids the space and the room to be able to feel those emotions. It's okay that they're disappointed and angry. As frustrating and as overwhelmed as you might be feeling, it's okay that they're experiencing this and this is their way of experiencing those emotions. And then also provide them the support and the modeling to help them regulate themselves through these feelings. How you model that is, as you're feeling frustrated and overwhelmed and upset about them having this tantrum, you're feeling the pull of trying to keep them from having to feel any pain, but also the frustration of these really loud noises, what you can do there is try to regulate yourself. Talk about what you're experiencing, being like, wow, I'm feeling so overwhelmed with how loud it's getting, and I'm feeling frustrated. I'm gonna take some deep breaths here calm myself and try to better be here for you. And by doing that, you're showing your kids how to do that. And by talking about your own experiences, you're actually encouraging your kids to think about what their sensations are. And then you're validating their emotions, you're giving them space, you're giving them comfort if they need it, you're helping them through these feelings. And the benefit of doing this is that we're raising children who are going to be in tune with their feelings, be able to express themselves better, and be able to cope with those emotions better, which also means that they're going to be better able to solve problems with their peers whenever those issues arise. We're building a foundation for emotional intelligence that is going to carry with them for the rest of their lives.